it's, this is really exciting energy. I'm really happy that that break was an extended break. Right? I used to be early for things, and now that I have a child and a dog, I'm late for everything. So this is, this is really good. Um, so welcome back. And I would like to welcome uh, Alan Corbier, who will give our first presentation. But first, a bit about Alan. Alan Ujig Corbier, Bene Dodum, Ruft Grouse Clan, is Anishinaabe from Michigan First Nation on Manitoulin Island. He was educated on the reserve and then attended the University of Toronto for a Bachelor's of Science. He then entered York University and earned his Master's of Environmental Studies. During his master's studies, Alan focused on Anishinaabe narrative and language revitalization. For five years, he served as the executive director at the Ojibwe Cultural Foundation in Michigan, a position which also encompassed the roles of curator and historian. Alan also served as the Anishinaabe Mauen Revitalization Program Coordinator at Lakeview School, where he and his team worked on a culturally based second language program that focused on using Anishinaabe stories to teach language. Alan has just earned his doctorate at York University, so I want to welcome Dr. Alan Corbier. Thank you. Archives of Ontario. Meanwhile, Commission was a bananic, meanwhile, co commissa bananic, meanwhile, gay gunduk, Nishna bemjik, wa Nishna bemjik, meanwhile, ga Nishna bemjik, Misa and Nishna bemia, Nui Nishna bem to walk a gunduk, Nishna bemjik, meanwhile, wa Nishna bemjik, meanwhile, gay ga Nishna bemjik. So, what we meanwhile, the Shah, Nga Makwenama, uh, Gamakwenama gunduk, Ganamajajik. So I, I too, I have to speak uh, the little bit of language that I learned. When I was a boy, my parents spoke to each other in Ojibwe every day. But then they turned to me and my siblings and they spoke English. And so I never picked it up at home. But I ingin on wena. But every every day I heard heard our language. So I decided to try and learn it and uh, that's why I, I try to speak it. And so I'm grateful uh uh, I'm grateful to that man who spoke and opened up this this uh, gathering. And the reason I guy go I don't I don't understand. I didn't understand what he said. And to me, that's the the beauty of it, because it reminds me of how our people in Ishnabe and the Haudenosaunee would have met before. And that we didn't really understand each other's language, but we had people who actually were the interpreters who had to do that. So in order to make peace, we had to learn each other's way. And we had to learn each other's language and way of speaking. And uh, I want to hopefully show a bit, talk a bit about how this was done. So I also, like, like him, he spoke to all the creation, and then myself as well, what I had said is I want to keep in mind those that are yet to come, but I also want to remember the ones that have left. And I also want to speak that bit of that language for those that want to learn to speak our language, and then also the ones that do speak our language that live here currently, 
and then also the ones that spoke our language that have gone on, that lived here as well. So what we believe as Nishnabe people that we say, they're all around here still. Those people that speak our language, uh, the, our ancestors, and uh, as well as those clans, we call them, as well as those Atsokanak, those uh, what the spirits, we call them. Anyway, this is a, a letter, I mean, a, a broadside. And uh, it's actually written in Ojibwe by, in what I would call the Methodist or Anglican orthography. So it's a bit more uh, like how your English language is. Uh, the spelling is um, not the most consistent. And as opposed to if this were a French-inspired orthography, there would be more, it would be more rigorous and easier for me to read. So I found this here a while ago, and I was inspired by it because uh, I listened to a fellow named Chris Wolfhart, a linguist who works with Cree people. And he was talking about how when the treaties were made, the practice back then was actually to make sure that there were three uh, copies of that in three different languages. So if there was a, a treaty between the German and the uh, English, there would be a third copy. There'd be a copy in English, there'd be a copy in German, and then there'd be a copy in French. So that if there were any dispute between the German and the English version, you would default to the French version of that treaty. So what he had said, this Chris Wolfhard, is uh, by the time the treaties came out to the prairies, the Bible had long been translated as well as other hymnals and other, other uh, um, literature. He says, and the, the, the actual priest was the interpreter, and he wrote in his journal, I went down to the lake to gather my thoughts on how I was going to translate this. And he says, where, where are his notes to this? And so that got me thinking, well, they had translators, and then here, this is actually written in 1866 by the government. And you see the, the, the king's arms up there, the coat of arms. So they actually had the capacity to, to write our treaties in our language, but they never did. This is actually a proclamation that was posted at the church in, in Wicomacon. And it says that uh, after that treaty in 1862, the chiefs had expelled other chiefs that, were, that signed that 1862 treaty, and so when they expelled those tree, uh, those chiefs, they said, "You go live on the sea, uh, the ceded portion of the island. This is an unceded portion." And this, the government wrote back and said, "You cannot do that. You cannot expel people from your community, and you have to take them back in." So when it suited the government's purposes, of course they they wrote in our language, but when it didn't suit their purpose, they didn't write in our language, even though they had the capacity. So I, I was at a conference in uh, Dartmouth, and we, we ended up publishing a book. Uh, all of our the fellow presenters put together a book. And I think it's called The Afterlives of Indigenous Archives. And in that, uh, a lady named Ellen Cushman wrote uh, an article in there about the Cherokee literacy. One of the things that, uh, that I like that she wrote in there is uh, the first thing she, she says is, this is a quote, as soon as the word archive is used, it evokes four imperialist tenets of thought, tradition, collection, artifacts, preservation. These tenets of imperialist thought structure archives, whether in material or digital form, end quote. So I've, I've often thought of this, and this is why I chose this as the beginning uh, slide, is that here it, it is about, uh, this is a whole imperialist uh, endeavor, in a sense, of collecting different information. And one of the things that I wanted to also start off or situate myself is that uh, I was part of a um, court case and last, last year, that court case wrapped up, and we, we won that court case, the Robinson-Huron Treaty Annuity case, it's called uh, Restul et al. versus the, uh, Ontario and uh, Canada. So Canada now accepted that we, we won, 
and they're ready to negotiate. And here, Ontario actually is appealing that court case. So I, I kind of stand here um, cognizant that I'm, I'm part of the, I'm addressing an arm of the Ontario government that is actually uh, disputing our claims yet again. So <clears throat> the other fella in that uh, book is uh, a colleague of mine, Tom Peace. But he quotes Rodney Carter, and he, he says that Rodney Carter actually, the quote that he uses of Rodney Carter says, those marginalized by the state are marginalized by the archive. And uh, then he f continued further, he says, archival violence is found in the use of documents to enforce and naturalize the state's power and in the act of silencing of the disenfranchised. So those are pretty uh, blunt words, and um, I really identified with them. I I was reading this book uh, that that collection. Even though you know you sit in these uh, conferences and you um, take notes, and I rarely revisit my notes, but when it was actually published as a book, then I and my article uh, chapter was in there. So I thought, well, I'll re I'll reread this, and then I found it. Uh, good to revisit what what the other scholars had been saying as well so it was uh, it was good to to read that and I've never been to uh, this conference and it's always kind of around the same time as the Algonquin conference uh, it's uh, about the tribal uh, libraries and archives uh, conference that they have every year so I've never made it out there yet and there's a whole body of uh, literature there to to actually explore as well and then uh, another person that I, that I really looked at and read, when I read her article, I, I also thought, well, okay, how am I going to address this in this talk? So she, it's Jennifer O'Neill, and her chapter was called From Time Immemorial, Centering Indigenous Traditional Knowledge and Ways of Knowing in the Archival Paradigm. So her quote is, making these changes in the profession means recognizing historical indigenous settler relationship that often governs, governs these collections and revealing the relational power dynamics between indigenous and Western science that permeates archival repositories today. Thus, we must recontextualize the historical narrative by placing indigenous history and knowledge at the center of the archival paradigm." End quote. So the whole I, I believe what part of the, the gathering here, purpose of this gathering is summarized in that statement, we must recontextualize the historical narrative by placing indigenous history and knowledge at the center of the archival paradigm. And when I was asked uh, uh, maybe six, four months ago to come and talk here, I didn't know the, the actual quest questions. So, Ngike, now Nagara went on, I thought off and on throughout, I thought, how am I going to talk about this? And uh, well, like many of you, you, you do a draft, then you do another one, and then you, you, you reflect on what you want to say and what's going on, and then, of course, it, it changes again. So I saw on the, I thought, well, I'll look at the website here of the, the conference, and I didn't actually see these. I, they must have emailed me them, but I uh, just, you know, you get so busy with your email um, that you just gloss over some of the stuff. So how have indigenous communities engaged in archival practices and in memory work? I said, okay, I can try and answer that. What does an indigenous archives look like? What does it do? What does the community need from the knowledge, their knowledge keepers, elders, and memory workers? So here's where I thought, okay, I'll, I'll try and deal with this a bit more. So Nishnabe people, Gundak gets a pichijik, gain wakajik, a pane ekadoat. Our elders and our wise people always say our land is our, archa is our history book, our land is our Bible. So, but we're in an archival institution that's actually uh, using 
and preserving documents and other items. This is actually pictographs that are at the Agua Canyon, which is north of Sault Ste. Marie, northwest of Sault Ste. Marie in the Lake Superior Provincial Park. So there's a whole narrative that goes with this, but these, the, on your left are the actual pictures of the pictographs. And on the right is actually uh, Henry Rowe Schoolcraft, uh, actually uh, questioned a chief named uh, Jiguacons, and that means Little Pine. And Little Pine described it and he etched it out, but then Schoolcraft got uh, Eastman to repaint these and he published them. So on the bottom here, you see that those canoes and that bird, that's actually that top part. And then you see that man on a horse drawn there. And then you see it over on the lower, your lower left. But what's interesting is how here, that arc, and the, it has three discs in it, but actually on the, the actual pictograph, the arc is inverted and it has actually four discs. I, from what I understand, it's four moons. And uh, here it's three moons. So it's interesting is to me then what this shows why I'm showing this, is you gotta go to the site. You can't just go to the book. And uh, although this, of course, we all know that they, these things get mediated. This was taken down by the, the great chief, Jiguacons, and he described it and then it was drawn but you see how it, been, it has been altered. This is actually the chief, uh, Ojibwe chief, uh, and that means Little Pine, and he's a signatory to the 1850 treaty, and he was one of the main actual pushers behind it. And he was the one who was uh, insisting on this uh, escalator clause that the recent court case was about. And he was the one who successfully negotiated that 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 uh, annuity should increase if the province actually, uh, or the government actually uh, realized more profit and that they could uh, increase it, that they should in their discretion. These are two of my kind of favorite quotes of his. In uh, 1829, this was at St. Joseph's Island and this is a historic site. At St. Joseph's Island, there was a council fire uh, and what they call a council fire is actually a fort. And this fort was the British garrison was stationed there and they were to deliver warmth to the Anishinaabek. And when we say we, we were to receive warmth, it meant a uh, presence. And it meant cloth, blankets, gunpowder, ammunition, as well as uh, what we say, uh, rum. So here he, he's addressing the uh, all in attendance there. And these gatherings would be attended by Ho-Chunk people, what you may know as Winnebago, uh, Menominee people, uh, Ojibwe, Odawak, Minwage, Bode, Adamik. So the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and the uh, Ojibwe and Potawatomi, Odawa people, as well as the Sioux people. And even some years after the War of 1812, the Sauk and Fox, like the great chief uh, Black Hawk came up there as well but also Drummond Island. So he says, holding a few strings of wampum in his hand and said, Father, the great master of life gave us pipes and wampum for the purpose of conveying our ideas from man to man. And then again, uh, when he heard that these presents were gonna be discontinued in 1852, that's when they heard the news. And uh, he says, Father, we salute you. We beg of you to believe what we say, for though we cannot put down our thoughts on paper as you, our wampums and the records of our old men are as undying as your writings, and they do not deceive. So that one's probably my favorite quote. So the idea is that we have our own records, the records of our old men, and it's in wampum. He didn't mention birch bark scrolls, but that would be another. And then also what I'll talk about are uh, pipes and pipe stems and how they were decorated, as well as other items that were decorated as well. So one of the things that I wanted to address was what does an indigenous archive look like? How was it stored? How was it cared for? And I'll see if, I, uh, if I'm successful. These colors, this is a quote from uh, Pierre de Charlevoix, 
when he was a, he wrote a journal of his uh, voyage to North America. Quote, these collars are carefully preserved, and collars in this case means wampum belts. The French called them collars, and I think that's more accurate translation than uh, belts. And not only compose part of the public treasures, but are likewise their registers or annals, and ought to be studied by those who have charge of their archives, which are deposited in the cabins of the chief, end quote. So it was the chief who kept the, the wampum belts in his wigwam, but here I believe he's actually talking about Haudenosaunee people, but uh, again, the chief in a Haudenosaunee didn't have his own cabin, so it's unclear as if he's actually talking about a Haudenosaunee person or, or Nishtabe or Huron. But here, this one I'll actually refer to is uh, by a, a fellow named Peter Clark who wrote his uh, history of the Wendat people. Quote, about this time, the king or head chief of the Wendat, Satsaratse, called a meeting at the house of Chief Adam Brown, who had charge of the archive for the purpose of overhauling them, which consisted of wampum belts, parchments, and the like, contained in a large trunk. One by one was brought out and showed to the assembled chiefs and warriors. Chief Brown wrote on a piece of paper and tacked it on each wampum belt, designating the compact or treaty it represented. After it had been explained from memory by the chiefs appointed for that purpose, there sat before them, before them their venerable, venerable king, in whose head was stored the hidden contents of each wampum belt. Listening to the rehearsal and occasionally correcting the speaker and putting him on the right track whenever he deviated, here was an accumulation of documents during a period of about 70 years and which took them two or three days to examine and rearrange them all in proper order. So the one, there's a number of things in this. One is that it's stored in a trunk. So I was actually going to put a big trunk on my slide here. But, uh, and that doesn't sound very Aboriginal or Indigenous or whatever word you want to use now, native. The other part is that what I liked is here sat before them their venerable king in whose head was stored the hidden contents of each belt. So to me, this actually says that the archive is not only the physical, tangible objects, the archive is actually in the minds and hearts of the people who are trained to keep that. So, and then the other thing that's important in this is that they actually got together and brought them out and that they put them in order. They all laid all those documents out, parchments, and wampum belts and read them to each other. And then the other significant thing is he then wrote a little, put a little piece of paper on each of them. So for our people, Nishnabe people, we have, we, uh, the Odawa were entrusted with this covenant chain wampum belt of 1764 that was delivered at Niagara. And in 1852, the Reverend Hallen had did a rubbing of this. He borrowed it from the Jean-Baptiste Siganoc and then what he noted was that attached to that wampum belt was uh, ribbons as well as strings of uh, hankered of uh, wampum strings, but also a piece of paper. And on that paper, it said it had uh, a number of names, and those names were the previous keepers of those belts. So the, the another point that I want to stress is we did start to incorporate writing into our archive as well, which to some people is uh, people, like when I started doing this kind of work and I started uh, interviewing elders and writing out what they're saying, transcribing what they're saying, translating what they're saying, a lot of people would come up to me and say, you can't do that, you shouldn't do that. Our language is oral, we never, we never used to write our language. But I found all these documents written in the mid 19th century, written in Ojibwe by the chiefs. So I, I keep telling people, yes, we did write in our language and we use what was at our disposal. So here is uh, uh, Peter Clark again. In 1842, when some of the Wendat had left Canada to join their nation in Ohio and to emigrate with them to Kansas the year following, the trunk containing the wampum belts and documents was left in the care of a member of the Wyandotte Band in Canada, who it was supposed intended to follow the emigration party. 
The trunk was sent to the Wyandots in, in Ohio, who took it with them to Kansas. In 1864, a member was authorized by the band to bring back what he could find of the then broken up archives and scattered documents which had been sent away from Canada in 1842. But he found only part of the wampum belts and some papers. Thus were broken up and scattered to the four winds the archives of the Wyandotte nation. The archives were held, when entire, by the Wyandots in Canada as something sacred left to them by their forefathers." End quote. So here, what I omitted was that the Indian agent was George Ironside at that time, and he had a, 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 a wife there, and their kid was George Ironside Jr., and he became the Indian agent as well. And he's the one that uh, denied them. They wanted to bring that trunk with them. And he said, no, we'll, we'll keep this. So what I'm trying to find out in our area as well is sometimes the chiefs actually were the ones that keeping, were keeping it. And then other times, sometimes for reasons of uh, safety, it was kept in the Indian agent's house or safe as well. So this archive ends up through the interruption and the actions of the Indian agent that it gets dispersed all over. It's no longer kept in the trunk. And here, this is, uh, again, I referred to Ellen Cushman here. So she says, quote, if the first move in decolonizing the archive is to challenge Western understandings of time as, ne as a necessary underpinning for tradition, the second move takes up the problem of collecting artifacts. The actions involved in the collection of artifacts damage them in three ways. One, the item is taken out of its context of use. Two, it is no longer understood in relation to the stories that place the item in its context and in relation to the people who use it. And three, the people who would ostensibly have uses for the item are necessarily presumed to be no longer living." End quote. So again, this comes back to what uh, the first quote of, um, of Rod Rodney Carter about the archives and that uh, those marginalized by the state are marginalized by the archive. And that uh, when it's all dispersed like that, and of course, many of you may have grown up after going to school thinking that the Huron are extinct. And so we have this whole narrative of extinction tied to the Huron Wendat people as well. And of course, they, they are not extinct. This, uh, at that point, what I've been talking about could be just the Huron Wendat archives. But uh, we were the we were in alliance with them. The Ojibwe, the Odawa, and Potawatomi were their allies. So what we ended up calling them, we look at ourselves as Anishinaabe people, as indigenous people, in terms of kinship. So Anishinaabe, the Odawa and Ojibwe and Potawatomi people look at themselves as three brothers. All say that the Potawatomi are the youngest. And then what the Odawa and Ojibwe kind of argue over is who's the oldest. And this, this kind of matters to us because uh, the, the elders have uh, presumably more wisdom and more, more rights to speak. Similarly, we called the, uh, the uh, Huron our uncles, and they were the uncles of the Western Confederacy. And then the Delaware and Muncie people, we called them our grandfathers. Even if they were younger than me, if, so, if there was a Delaware person here I would, uh, and they were younger than me, I'd still call them my grandfather. So that's what, uh, how we, we looked at this as a, a big family on this, what we call Turtle Island. So here, this is uh, the, four, the four nations now entered into an arrangement about their country the Ojibwe, Wendat, Potawatomi, and Odawa to share the land. It was also decided that the Wyandotte should be the keeper of the International Council Fire, the locality of which was to be figuratively represented by a column of smoke reaching to the skies 
and which was to be observed and acknowledged by all Indian nations in and around this part of North America. From that period might be dated the first introduction of the wampum belt system, representing an agreement among the four nations. The belt was left with the keepers of the council fire. From that time forward until the year of 1812, when the council fire was removed from Michigan to Canada, every wampum belt representing some international compact was placed in the archives of the Wyandotte or Wendat nation. Each belt bore some mark denoting nature, the nature of a covenant or contract entered into between the parties and hidden contents of which was kept in the memory of the chiefs. So here, Clark makes a footnote uh, about the, the term council fire. And he says the term council fire in a general sense signified their international archives, which the Wyandots had charge of, and who at the same time were arbiters in their general council on any important question that may concern the whole of these combined, meaning all the nations. So here again, when there's any dispute, an arbiter in our language would be an uncle. He's the one who helped settle that dispute. And so as well, the council fire is, has, is a many layered metaphor uh, in, in our indigenous uh, uh, thought and diplom diplomacy. So here, we, the council fire actually can mean, mean this, the physical fort, but it also can mean the archive and also the place where knowledge is sought. So the Anishinaabe people now, when we gather in a traditional form, we always have a fire. And we always offer tobacco to that. And then that, again, when he said that the column of smoke would go up, and that's that not only the smoke from the wood, but that's the, the prayers of the tobacco burning for us. So again, this, uh, we have this sacred notion uh, attached to fire and to council fire and to meeting. And then also many of you might know that when we also gather, we'll, we'll feast. And then different types of feasts we do. One of the types of feasts is we'll put food in that fire for, for the deceased as well. So the other thing that I want to mention at this time is when the, the Treaty of Niagara, when the British gave us that wampum belt, from 1764 to 1854, they gave us these presents at uh, Niagara, Detroit, Amherstburg, Fort Malden, and then uh, Drummond Island, Penetanguishene, and uh, Michilimackinac, as well as Mantuaning on Mantuan Island from 1836 to 1854. But if you look at the requisition of presents there, tobacco is always on there. They always knew, they knew enough to come when they met with us that they were to give us tobacco. So they always gave us tobacco as this place to, to, to change. So again, I have to re reiterate O'Neill's charge, quote, thus we must recontextualize the historical narrative by placing indigenous history and knowledge at the center of the archival paradigm, end quote. So what I'm trying to explain to you is what, how our archive worked and what Peter Clark says, Doyen Teta says, is that the council fire is the archive. And it's also the memory of the chiefs that are there, as well as the physical items, the parchments, and the, and the actual wampum. But to go further, to just make this very plain and explicit, is that uh, they had yearly gatherings, or as near as a year, yearly gathering as they could, where they invited the different stakeholders as well. So that's why uh, this, this gathering here is important and I liked uh, the opening remarks by the director here, Nalgan Zikan Dung, what we would say, or Bapa San Dip, what we would say, the, the head of this place, when he said that they're, they're here to listen, not to sell or what, they're, what they have. So here, this is another fellow, his name is uh, Thomas Forsythe, and he was an Indian agent with the Sock and Fox uh, from the 1820s up to 1830s, just before the breakout of the Black Hawk War. So what he says is, uh, quote, it is hard for me to say at this late day where and when the Council Fire originated. It existed at Old Chillicothe in the state of Ohio, 
and in 1783, the Council Fire was by unanimous consent removed to Fort Wayne, thence for afterwards to the foot of the rapids of the Miami River of the Lakes, where it remained until 1796, when it was removed to Brownstown, where it now is. So Brownstown is just south of Detroit there. And hopefully this comes together, but I want to make you understand that Brownstown was set up by Adam Brown, who uh, Peter Clark is talking about, that was the head chief there. And then afterward, what hopefully comes together as well is that what Brownstown is actually the council fire of the Western Confederacy in, as opposed to the Confederacy or the council fire between the British and the Western Confederacy, which was actually at Amherstburg or Fort Malden. So this, this will try, I'll try and pull this all together. Between the years 1740 and 1751, the principal portion of the Wendats had taken permanent possession of the country between Fort Detroit and the River Huron in Michigan. Their main village was at a place now called Gibraltar and about opposite Amherstburg on the mainland where they erected their council house. In this village was kept their archives and international council fire. So again, the two are almost synonymous, but he makes it explicit that it's the international archives and the council fire as well. So there, this is a belt that was collected from the Wendat, and it's, uh, it's got a, the road of peace, and it's got three diamonds representing three nations. And then this is another wampum belt, same collection, and it was uh, collected by Horatia Hale, but these two are now at the Pitt Rivers Museum in uh, Oxford, England. And just to emphasize the point that I don't know if these were the ones that were actually part of the international archives that uh, Peter Clark is talking about, but it actually sounds like this top one is the four, four squares. But I won't talk about that. But it, it's uh, the the point is that these are now elsewhere, and that talking again about uh, O'Neill's uh, uh, quote. I got five minutes already. Oh. That was a quick 40 minutes. So here, these are the different nations that were part of that um, archive. And they're, they're, they're listed here. So here, the British Confederacy with the Shawano, Delaware, Mingo, Wyandot, Chippewa, Odao, and Potawatomi are an offensive and defensive members of this council fire. When any business is to be done that concerns the Confederacy, it must be done at this council fire where are assembled as many chiefs as it can be conveniently collected. At any meeting this council fire, the British government is always represented by their Indian agent and most generally accompanied by a military officer to represent the soldiers or braves. All Indians in forming alliances with each other select a central spot to meet every two or three years to commemorate and perpetuate their alliance. These alliances are strictly attended to by all parties concerned and should there be any neglect to visit the council fire by deputies or otherwise to commemorate their alliance, it is considered as trifling with their allies. So basically attendance to the council fire and a general council was mandatory. And if you didn't show up, it meant that you, you, didn't, you were kind of dissing the whole thing. So here, this is the same thing when, when this is what I like to see here at the, this particular gathering is that you got different people here that are from the communities that come to see what's actually here and then to participate and to share. So the idea is that this is, would be a metaphorical council fire as well, where we're sharing information with each other. So the idea of meeting regularly with diverse, interested, invested groups remind me of another of Jennifer O'Neill's charges. She says, uh, quote, respect and implement our traditional knowledge systems. So one of the most important actions in this process is to learn as much as possible about the community, their history, life ways, traditions, and beliefs. This should always serve as your foundation as each community is different and one requires different approaches to stewardship of its archive. So these are belts that may have been uh, part of that, but some of these, like I said, the other two belts are at Pitt Rivers Museum in uh, Oxford, England, and these ones are actually at the National Museum of American Indian. 
And here, I wanted to just talk about that. I uh, read Andrew Newman's book called On Records, and he talks about uh, mnemonic communities as also discourse communities. And when we talk about mnemonic communities, we look at these wampum belts and we see how many different nations actually understood the symbols that were on the belts and that this whole diplomatic metaphor reached and extended beyond the Great Lakes. And you see how many people are actually gathered here. This bottom one is Mantuani, and they would estimate that there's anywhere between 2,000 and 3,000 people there from the, all the way from North Bay to uh, out to Lake Superior that would come and uh, to the council fire. But here, this is the one that I, I'll, I'll, I guess I have to end at, is uh, in uh, Niagara, they had uh, the fort. And this is at the Fort Niagara, and it was uh, Sir William Johnson who wrote this. And he met with the Mississaugas on the, who were from the North Shore of Lake Ontario. And he says, brethren, the many belts of wampum and calumets of peace which hang in this room convince me of your and of the neighboring nation's good intentions and the just sense which you all entertain of the blessings arising from peace and our friendship. And what he noted there is that the commander's room in the forts where conferences are held and where all the belts which the Indians deliver are hung up, end quote. So at each of these forts, the ones that I mentioned, like Fort Niagara, Fort Detroit, Amherstburg, Michelin-Mackinac, uh, had a commander's room. And then the different nations would come and they'd bring in pipes or they'd bring in wampum belts. And then these were pledges of alliance and these were renewed annually or biannually. And each time they did that, it was, uh, it was of course, uh, ceremonial and it was also uh, to do with the council fire. So here, this is to show you that we actually did this on our own as well. We, we met and we had our own archives that was not tied to uh, the government or colonial entities. This is a sampling of how those uh, calumet stems looked and their, their pipes. So one last thing, I heard the bell but I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> so the commander's room is, the commander's room at forts is mutual space between indigenous people and colonial entities. That's a shared space. And what I showed you what the Andrew Blackbird said was that they had all these pipes, the Odawa people kept all these pipes for different nations. That one is our space. And so this last quote is actually uh, uh, from, taken from a book uh, by the middle, uh, called The Middle Ground by Richard White. And he said, before Joseph Brandt and the Iroquois agreed to light a council fire at Brownstown, and remember that I told you to keep in mind Brownstown, they demanded that the Hurons clearly separate themselves from the British. Although the Hurons were the eldest nation in the West and the ablest brethren we have in this corner, quote, here's what uh, he recorded that Brandt had said, we have never yet been able rightly to distinguish your fireplace. Whenever we, the five nations, come to you on private business, you introduced us to the English fire. When you should have had one under your own roofs, we therefore now brighten your fire that we may see it at a distance. If you look upon yourselves as a free people, you should keep a fire of your own. So in the end, this is my concluding, um, in the end, I also advocate for funds to establish our own archives or our own fire. As mentioned, I'm cognizant that I'm in the Ontario archives, an arm of the Ontario government that eschewed negotiation in order to appeal a court case that was won by the Anishinaabeg. And this again is tied to this whole, the four uh, tenets of uh, imperialist thought. So, miigwech ki bizinda mek kine enchi ek ki bija ek nungo. Miigwech nui ngakke miigwech yu aakun dak en ki jik. So thank you all for taking the time to listen to me and indulging my two more minutes.
we actually do have time for some questions, if you're open to questions. Um, for those of you on the virtual feed, you can put questions in the chat and they'll be conveyed back to us. Uh, and Jay here in the room has a microphone if anyone has questions or comments from the room. Nobody usually asks questions. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> This is the Williams papers, which is which are housed here at the uh, at the Ontario Archives, and part of this uh, also is part of the Badash papers. They say Podash papers, but Badash means he comes sailing this way, or he comes floating or flying this way, and that was a chief at Rice Lake. So they wrote down in Ojibwe what the their understanding of the gunshot treaty is. And uh, David McNabb, who used to work for the Ontario Ministry of whatever it was called back then, uh, transcribed this. And so what I wanted to show is that, uh, and this comes back to Cushman's, is that you actually need us. Because in, in his transcription, he, he, once in a while he writes R's, and there are no R's in our language. So he's mistranscribed uh, some of the words. But this would take somebody to go through this and really write it out, how we transliterate it to how we write today. And so this is again recontextualizing, and they, they actually have uh, valuable information in this that we could use in our communities again. But if anybody thought of a question, uh, Just share on your belts that you have in England. Have you ever tried to get those repatriated? I haven't because I'm not uh, uh, when that. But uh, Marge will answer. It's actually a very timely question because the Pitt Rivers Museum and British Museum are currently initiating consultation with the tribal nations that their belts are related to. And ironically, because of the sale of those Wyandotte belts and the purchase by Horatio Hale, it's been presumed for nearly two centuries that they were no longer meaningful and that they were no longer patrimonial, that they were simply owned by the chiefs who sold them. So we literally are, as we speak, initiating that new consultation. One. I'm from the Multicultural History Society of Ontario, and we're currently working with the Ojibwe and Cree Cultural Centre in Timmins on a collection of interviews, over 300 interviews, that we, <clears throat> uh, in a collaboration conducted in the late 1970s. These interviews have always been in the possession of the centre. Anyway, we're trying to develop culturally re relevant metadata, describe the interviews um, from an indigenous perspective, develop contextual materials that are from an indigenous perspective. But it's still an exercise, I think, in repair to um, redress the harm done previously. Um, so I wonder, obviously, the, the best course of action is indigenous-run archives. But what do you think about collaborations? I, I think they're necessary. Like, and that was <clears throat> basically uh, what I was saying is that what, I'm, what I was trying to say is that that commander's fort, there was a space for collaboration. And then, but what I was saying, what, what Joseph Brandt had said is that there actually needs also to be a place where it's just ours. And then part of this is, is political. And throughout my talk, I referred to how uh, the Ontario government is actually still taking us to court for uh, this this other court case, which we, we had won, and they appealed. So there is, uh, we do want to collaborate, and we have to collaborate, basically because the majority of this uh, material has been taken, sometimes illegally, and uh, other times uh, coercively purchased. And then, so we want to get this stuff back, but then like what I was trying to show here and like this actual 
uh, last document shows this as well, is that uh, you could save this all you want and keep it, uh, but you actually won't be able to understand it without us at this point. So that's the other thing is when you, and then the, also with uh, these belts, there's a lot of different uh, research that goes on and that is necessary to reconstitute that archive. So like that's why I started with the that when that story was because uh, they were actually seen as the uncles and they were the ones to keep these international belts. But that doesn't mean that we didn't have our own belts. So there's Anishinaabe people, Odawa people that actually kept belts and I know who those people were. But uh, there, I, wa I was trying to show that we had as a collective of different nations our own archive as well, and that we actually needed that, and we we uh, we actually um, feasted that, and we renewed that from time to time, and that it took many days to actually go through it, and uh, as he said, overhaul it and put it in order. So that's the the work that needs to be done, but we're uh, in certain instances uh, there is room to collaborate because uh, different uh, collections have been been made by the government. So whenever we've written in petition, the governor general or the lieutenant governor general or the department, uh, the minister of Indian affairs or the uh, superintendent general of Indian affairs, there's a copy here. So sometimes we, in uh, in our area in 1836, there was a, a treaty made for Manitoulin Island and Sir Francis Bondhead was the lieutenant governor at the time. And he says, uh, I entered into a treaty with them, and then I, I made it in duplicate. I enclosed one copy here for our records, and the other I left with the, the, the head chief there. But he didn't actually say which chief it was. And so I've been trying to see, well, who, who was it? I have strong suspicion who it was, but, uh, and then where, whatever became of it. So I don't know where our copy of that treaty is. So that's the, the next part is, so we got to track a lot of these things down, whereas there actually is a copy already in these archives. So our archives got this uh, dispersed, and then, but here, Ontario and Canada were able to keep an archive that we can still access and that we have to access at this point. So what I'm advocating is now, actually there is collaboration because basically it's funding. He's uh, got all the money, and uh, also a lot of the know-how. And what we we need to do is to uh, we need you to collaborate with us to empower us to build up our archive in this new digital world, because we could still keep going how we're going, uh, and to strengthen that. But there are other things that we I personally would like to put into an archive. And when I worked for the Chiging First Nation, I recorded a bunch of elders too. And we have those on our website. And I trans, uh, translated and uh, I transcribed what the elders said in Ojibwe. And then, so we are already building up our archive. So a number of different times, um, a number of different times we've been asked, um, the University of Alberta actually brought us all together maybe five, well, that's probably 10 years ago. And the University of Alberta wanted to make a centralized archive for indigenous languages for all of Canada. And so they brought a bunch of language workers from across Canada together. And then uh, uh, it was a good idea, but it blew up. And the reason it blew up was a lot of people had just have had bad experiences with archives. And basically what, I kind of was one of the ones that kind of put the uh, first nail in the coffin and um, or the first uh, shot that did the first cut or whatever. And it was because we have had uh, our archives in our in the Ojibwe Culture Foundation where I used to work. And we, we were never able to actually get them digitized because we didn't have the, our funding request got turned down. And then it sounded, it just sounded galling to me that I would then send that all over to a university, three or four provinces over to get digitized and then they store it. And then I'm, I don't have access anymore, direct access. And then I'm, I'm at their whim 
of when I'm actually going to access that. So I, I said, uh, and they, they had different models, and I just said, no, we want to be able to control this ourselves and our, for our elders to access and our students to access that uh, they come to us, not to you. So that was basically, there's collaboration. You could help us do that. But it doesn't mean that you end up owning everything or have, being the gatekeeper again. And that's that's what we're going against. Are you? Sorry, Dr. Kabir, I'm not sure if you... I have a question from the webcast audience. Okay. Okay, uh, so we have a question from Trevor Holmes, who's at the University of Waterloo. And he says, um, I'm interested in the uh, act of transcription as non-neutral. Typically, my students type what they see, slash what they can decipher of white women's diaries, etc., and see their role as neutral. But with transcription across languages and cultures, you point out the problems of transliteration. Is there a non-extractive way to set up the partnerships between classroom-based transcribing assignments and language speakers inside and outside institution without burning out the language speaker partners? Number one answer for me would be pay the indigenous collaborator collaborators. But there are complicated questions to address beyond that. And he also says, thank you so much for your, your, your sharing today and your work. Um, that's the, the thing, uh, what he mentioned about the burnout. Um, and where the people that can do this kind of work are rare. So, and then you got to pay them. So that's the other thing. And it is a bottleneck. So the idea that what i am been trying to do, and the short answer is no. That, <laughs> but uh, what I've been trying to do is uh, is um, actually get more people that are able to transcribe uh, an interview, and we got a number. We got a quite a bit of language Anishinaabemo and language programs, and that this should actually. And we actually got a lot of a lot of students that take linguistics, and it seems like to me that it shouldn't be so hard to actually work, get them to work on transcribing elder interviews. But it seems like uh, the linguists that are teaching the courses ha have uh, get them to transcribe different things rather than what collaborate with you know, an institution like the Woodland Cultural Center or the Ojibwe Culture Foundation or any other uh, uh, institution that actually is trying to build a corpus of material and to build that on an online uh, uh, archive. So actually, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, when I get working that I'm able to hire students. And then w it's basically a process of workflow. So sometimes, what, to answer his question, what I find sometimes is people bring the language speaker in too early. And then they burn them out, because they're asking them for every little thing. So myself, like, I don't know if, he's, if he has facility with the language he's working with. But myself, I do, a, a, I liken it to when, uh, although I was the executive director at the Ojibwe Culture Foundation, and I said that I was, uh, it entailed roles as curator and historian, I actually was the director of snow removal as well. <laughs> <laughs> and setting up chairs and putting away chairs. And so when I would uh, shovel the walkway, you know, some people just go right through, do one pass, and then clean it up. Others actually go along and make it nice and clean all the way till they get to the end of the driveway. So there's, that's two ways of how I look at it when you're doing a transcription, is what I do when I do a transcription, I go right through, and I have all these different mistakes or uh, where I'm unclear, and I just use square brackets there to indicate that I need to ask the elder if this is or the speaker, if this is right or wrong. Uh, and then once I go through with them, then I, do, I find I don't tax them as much, because I do that first clear pass. Whereas I think what others are doing is they, they actually go with them and sit there with them to try and do it together. And I think if you actually sit there as a student of the language trying to pick it up and learn, then you actually get more out of it by actually spending more time with it and then complementing or supplementing that time with the elder speaker and then doing referring. Now there's all these uh, online dictionaries as well that, that help and different tools. 
when I first started, there was nothing like that. Uh, it was all books. So I think that's it's a workflow process to, to try and uh, alleviate there.